I'm George Gallo, and I present Kali Mahorra on Al Maidin Television. Here we are in London. I speak my words freely, either in Parliament, on television, here on the streets of London. Kali Mahorra means free word. That's what I speak. So Kali Mahorra is a two-way conversation. Check it out on Al Maidin Television. Welcome to Kali Mahorra with me, George Galloway, coming to you from London, but talking about China, Hong Kong, the United States and the United Kingdom's now near war with the People's Republic of China. You may think that hyperbolic, but then you haven't seen the American warships in the South China Sea, the clue being in the name, and you may have missed uh, the dispatching of a British gunboat an aircraft carrier, the Queen Elizabeth, to China's, quote, maritime frontier. The last time Britain sent a gunboat up the Yangtze, the Chinese sunk it, and that was in 1949. China has come a long way since then. So has Britain, but in the opposite direction. So what could possibly go wrong? A state of economic war already existed between the United States and China, with ever escalating sanctions and trade war announced repeatedly by Donald Trump over the last six months or so. And the attempt to blame China for the coronavirus and the handling of it by the American government uh, is only one of the reasons for that escalating tension. But Britain turned up the volume, they decided that the 5G involvement of the Chinese company Huawei was beyond the pale. They could continue to run 3G and 4G and even run our nuclear power plants, but don't ask us to allow a Chinese platform to screen Peppa Pig or Baby Bus or any of the other things you might watch on your mobile phone. So is it... Uh, handbags at dawn? Is it all just bluster? Or could all of this get out of control? I believe it could. And if President Trump is re-elected in November, which nobody would bet against, it's unlikely that he'll make a dramatic U-turn on his attitude to China. If he isn't re-elected, then the British are going to look rather foolish because the ink won't be dry on the banning order for Huawei by the time President Trump, for whom it is intended as a kowtow, before the British are forced to think again. I'm joined by an audience of distinguished experts who may or may not agree with my take on these matters. That's not important. In the studio with me, distinguished experts, and on screen from elsewhere, including Beijing, equally distinguished experts. The first of those is Duncan Bartlett, a journalist and editor and a specialist in Asia, a well-known face on British television, and I'm glad to say making his first appearance on Al Maidin. Duncan, where do you see all this going? Have I characterised it? remotely correctly. Well, I think you're right in that the narrative recently has been about great power competition, two great superpowers, the United States and China. And you're right to say that there's a reason to be alarmed. And that's because of the military exercises which are going on in the South China Sea, involving both American aircraft carriers and the Chinese Navy using destroyers to practice capturing boats in taking part in live fire exercises, also on the Straits of Taiwan, and now the imposition of the new security law at the beginning of July in Hong Kong. All of these have led to more tension between China and the rest of the world. And what we've seen is that America has been forming a closer alliance with countries like the United Kingdom, Canada and Australia to challenge China, including putting more military muscle into the region around China. So I am concerned that this could be an escalation of tensions. At the moment, it's looking like the Cold War. One of the really big difficulties is that it could lead to uh, a security situation which is out of control. 
Well, uh, that's the problem with cold wars, isn't it? That they can, by accident or design, become hot wars. And the uh, confrontation, if that's what you can call it, certainly the juxtaposition of the Chinese Navy and the British and American navies, it must be cause for concern if you want to avoid an actual shooting war. Now, the proximate reason for a British hostility, uh, apart from the Huawei uh, issue, is the uh, Hong Kong issue. Now, Britain obtained Hong Kong from China under duress. We bombarded them until they gave it to us uh, as a punishment for them refusing to accept any more British India opium, which had caused 90 million addicts in China uh, by the time that we did that. Now that we have given up Hong Kong, uh, we're taking perhaps an inordinately close interest in it, more than we did before. I mean, we're calling, for example, for democracy in Hong Kong when there was absolutely no democracy in Hong Kong when we ruled it. Uh, we are giving three million Hong Kong Chinese the right to come and settle in Britain. We didn't give any the right to do so when we ruled it. To what extent is Britain acting as a cat's paw for the United States in this? Well, what the British government says is that it is a matter of responsibility. That when Hong Kong was handed over to China in 1997, there was an agreement reached between the two countries. And part of that agreement would be that China would allow one country, two systems. And Hong Kong would be allowed a great deal of autonomy, including freedom of speech, freedom of assembly, and, crucially, multi-party elections. China has restricted Hong Kong's autonomy. And we know, of course, that there have been a lot of protests, particularly by young people in Hong Kong. And the response by China was quite slow, but it's led to the imposition of this new security law. America's complained about it, Britain has complained about it, and offered political refuge to about three million citizens from Hong Kong and their families. What's interesting, though, is politicians of all types in a country like the United Kingdom recognise the importance of free elections, whatever their policies are, they are very keen on that, and so therefore... Only in some they, places, of course. <laughs> they, they Not in Saudi Arabia, for example. Saudi Arabia we can come to in a minute, but, I mean, this... The, what they say is that they, they feel an empathy with the democratic political system within Hong Kong, and that's why they have been so supportive of the pro-democracy movement. Just one, one last question. Do you think the British public and the Conservative electorate after Brexit, which was quite often fought on the issue of mass immigration, are ready for three million Chinese immigrants arriving here. What are they going to do? Where are they going to live? How are they going to work? Well, the British government expects them to be an asset to society. And they point to the successful immigration of many other immigrants from Hong Kong in the latter, in the latter part of the last century, many of whom established things like Chinese restaurants. This new wave of immigrants of are likely to be highly educated and able to use their skills in a variety of different sectors, including things like fintech and uh, healthcare and education. Uh, Reverend Frank Gelly, Anglican Christian priest, writer and peace activist and a regular on Kali Mohora. Welcome back. Uh, where do you stand on this? You're a peace activist. Is this going to lead to war? Well, first of all, I want to say that uh, I admire the China as a great civilization. China has all the ingredients of a great civilization. Science, technology, art, the art of politics, poetry, literature, philosophy, you name it. So what I'm going to say now is not aimed at in any way attacking the Chinese people, whom I admire, but my problem is, is with the regime, the Beijing regime. And you would not be surprised to say my particular angle is spiritual and religion, religious. Now, because we are talking about Hong Kong, Cardinal Joseph Zen, who was Cardinal Archbishop of Hong Kong, and here I have his picture, he actually issued a very a fiery statement addressed to the Vatican, 
concerning a recent deal which they made with the Beijing regime over religious freedom. And he said, stop the murder of the church in China. Because the new agreement actually entails that clergy have to register. There is a civil register which the regime is using to exclude clergy who are uh, invidious to it and also to limit the freedom of conscience of Catholics in China, which is something which the Catholic Church cannot tolerate. And uh, uh, Cardinal Zen is saying that this deal entails the creation of a schismatic church. Uh, the official state recognized church we will be actually a schismatic church, a church which denies the authority of the, of the Pope, which is a benchmark of Catholicism. But I have to say, and uh, uh, George, um, time is limited, but it isn't just a question of the Catholic Church, but it's a question, I'm sure it's familiar to you, of the Uyghur people, a Muslim people in East Turkestan, in China, who have been persecuted in horrible ways. There is the question of Tibet, the persecution of Buddhists in Tibet, of Dalai Lama, a spiritual leader of Chinese or Tibetan Buddhists, who is actually, he's in exile, and um, he's not allowed to nominate his successors. It was a case of one of his successors, someone he nominated, the Panchen Lama, a boy of six years old, who was kidnapped and has never been seen again by the regime. And also uh, the Falun Gong, which is an association of spiritual practitioners. They do breathing exercises. I used to contribute to Epoch Times, which was their London paper. I don't know if it still exists. Uh, and they are engaging in completely harmless spiritual disciplines. Uh, it's as if uh, you were to ban yoga in this country. And well, they've been subjected to appalling persecutions. I mean, people speak of organ harvesting of uh, uh, Falun Gong practitioners who were arrested in prison and actually they were, their organs were taken out to be harvested. Now, uh, some of this may be a little bit exaggerated, I mean, the Falun Gong, but it is all this terrible, dark record of the regime concerning the spiritual organizations, which I'm really quite shocked by, and I have to speak out against. Well, you, you've certainly gone through the whole Pentagon uh, list of talking points, uh, so well done squeezing them in to one contribution. That means, therefore, you are in favor of the con confrontation with China. Uh, not a confrontation which would entail the exchange of uh, uh, missiles or, uh, uh, God forbid, nuclear weapons. I'm not in favour of a hot war. What no. about sending our warships there? Well, I mean, the good old days when Britain would send gunboats and teach the natives a lesson, they would all cringe and submit, they've gone. China is not their kind of country. It's not a country which you, can, you bring down to its knees by sending gunboats. Uh, matters have changed. Uh, I mean, England today is a kind of, the English line is a bit toothless, let's be, let's be honest. But certainly I'm in favour of a strong system of sanctions and standing up to uh, the regime. David Otto, you were a director of counter-terrorism and organised crime. Your MSc is in both of those subjects, but your interests include security, counter-terrorism, and so on. Uh, to what extent do you think there is a clear and present danger of rhetoric, uh, such as we've just heard, escalating and feeding an escalation uh, of, uh, of actual conflict with China? I, I think, you know, we've got to be able to move away from the um, mindset, um, thinking about the exchange of physical missiles and, you know, uh, uh, nuclear weapons and, you know, uh, firing each other. Uh, this is not longer the First and Second World War scenario. We're already experiencing the war between China and the West. And this war comes in economic form, you know, so... This war is already existing. You've got a, a war that is existing about COVID-19, for example. You know, this is a war because, you know, there has never been a time in the history of mankind that I know, you know, during my little time on this earth, where the entire, almost the entire planet is shut down by a virus. This is a war that 
nobody still has an understanding as to you know, the, the origin of this. So you, 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 you're looking at a broken biscuit scenario where everybody is expecting the United States to push missiles and you know, gunboats on the China Sea and China to exchange fires. No, that is not happening. We've seen an economic warfare already going on between China and the rest of the world. That is what is going to continue to happen. But not quite the rest of the world. Well, of course, yes, not quite the rest of the world. But you know, uh, uh, when we're talking about the US and the UK and China, uh, of course, recently um, we've seen the, the banning of the, the G5 Huawei system in the UK. I mean, this is all an economic warfare. The US has insisted, you know, because that it won't share any intelligence with the United Kingdom because they are part of the, um, the, um, the five, five eyes. eyes. They won't share any intelligence mm -hmm. if the UK goes along with the uh, 5G network with, uh, with China. So it already tells you that we are already experiencing a war, but not of the type that we experienced during the First and the Second World War. So it's already going on. Why are we sending uh, warships there then? Uh, this, is, this is a propaganda warfare, which um, you know, will, well, is, is just a flexing of muscles. Um, you've got to do that on the physical side, you know, to portray to the population, to your citizens, that you have the capacity and capability to fight China. But you know, and as, and as well as I do, that is never going to happen because... Well, you know, it, might, it might not be the intention, but as I was discussing with Duncan at the beginning, uh, there were many times happen. during the Cold War uh, that accidents uh, could well have happened. Yes. People mistaking reflections in the clouds for incoming missiles and so on. Yes, George, but you don't build policies based on accidents. You build policies on plans. You make plans. You know, the UK doesn't have a plan to fight China. China doesn't have a plan to fight the United States. They don't have plans to do that because they know the impact of that. Now, where mistakes happen, mistakes will always happen. Accidents could happen. But those accidents will be managed in such a way that they will not escalate to the level that we're thinking of. These countries have the capabilities and capacities to destroy each other. And nobody wants that to happen. So I think what we should be focusing on is looking at the proxy wars which are existing between these states. Where are they fighting these wars? Who are the smaller countries that have been used? You know, we see, we've seen this in Africa, which I will talk about later on, where Chinese soft power and economic influence is threatening the presence of the United States, the presence of the UK. We've seen that there. We've seen China's influence being threatened in the UK, for example, as I mentioned earlier. And, and, and in a lot of areas, that is already happening. So I think we should be looking at the war, not from the perspective of the First and the Second World War, but from an economic and psychological perspective. We will come back uh, to Africa later, I promise you that. Let's hear, though, from uh, Beijing, uh, where we have Dr. Huayao Wang. Uh, he is the president of the Center for China and Globalization, former Harvard and the Brookings Institute senior fellow. Uh, Dr. Wang. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Wang, in your opinion, what are the reasons for the conflict between the United States and China, and more recently, between the United Kingdom and China? Well, thank you, uh, George, for the uh, question. And uh, what I think that uh, uh, the problem that China has now with uh, US and, and recently with UK is largely due to the uh, recent a few years of uh, changes in the global geopolitical uh, uh, landscape, possibly. Uh, for example, in the last uh, uh, four decades, China has developed very fast. China has now become the second largest economy. Uh, China has embraced globalization. And of course, uh, China has uh, also established diplomatic ties with the US for the last four decades as well. But I think recently the U.S. probably shows uh, less confident, and then they uh, really, uh, you know, find that uh, uh, they are not uh, uh, leading in a big way, and then they find China is uh, uh, quickly, uh, uh, you know, catching up and poss possibly, uh, uh, you know, leading in many areas, uh, such as 5G, for example. Do you envisage the conflict between China and the West becoming? A new Cold War? Well, I think that, uh, you know, given the situation that, uh, you know, the US, UK and uh, some countries uh, view China as a, as, a, as a threat, so it's quite possible that uh, 
we are having some kind of a cold war uh, that uh, particularly in the tech front, we actually already seen this is, uh, is emerging as, for example, UK recently uh, banned Huawei uh, application in the, in the UK telecom market. So that's probably a, a start of some kind of a, a tech cold war. And of course, US has actually started that. US has actually, uh, uh, you, know, uh, you know, blocked Huawei for quite some time. And not only US uh, does that, and also it urges its allies to do the same. US arrested the CFO of uh, Huawei as well. And uh, so there's all those uh, uh, gestures suggest that uh, US is, uh, is adopting this kind of a, uh, approach. So I think this is really uh, very uh, sad then to see that. And uh, we don't want to see that, uh, you know, uh, really develop de de develop further. What impact will the conflict over Hong Kong have on future relations between China and the world? Well, I think that, uh, you know, there's all, all kind of reasons for deterioration of the Sino-US-UK relations. And uh, I think that, uh, you know, uh, China is certainly not perfect and uh, China has... Uh, uh, have, have done a lot of things right. And uh, uh, of course, China can also improve further. I mean, no, no country is perfect. But what I think what's happened in Hong Kong uh, is that for the last year, particularly for the last, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, six months of the last year, you know, Hong Kong is already totally chaotic. China, Hong Kong has been uh, become a, a, a epicenter of uh, some kind of violence and uh, uh, what what has been uh, first some legitimate com uh, uh, complaints of young people uh, uh, developed into some kind of violence. What happened in Hong Kong is really uh, you know uh, uh, Hong Kong has some legitimate concern, but then we cannot lose uh, law and order, and we cannot uh, uh, lose the, uh, uh, the the prosperity. Of course, for the South China Sea, it's the same. You know, China can handle that uh, with all the uh, ASEAN countries countries in the, in the, in a conflict, you know, in a dispute, and maybe you know, uh, pursue the South China Sea code of conduct. And China has been talking to those countries and can have a, a joint uh, declaration or joint exploitation of South China Sea. U.S. used to be used to say that they are they are neutral; they don't take standards. Now they have their aircraft, they have uh, airplanes, they have all the uh, things, uh, you know, uh, in the South China Sea. So make the things actually uh, quite tense. And, uh, you know, China has always said that the South China, uh, you know, navigation is never a problem. It's always, uh, uh, you know, safe and free for navigation, you know. So, so I think that, uh, you know, what I think the South China Sea needs to be addressed is really by having the, uh, uh, you know, the countries in the region and China talk among themselves and peacefully resolve that and gently exploit that uh, rather than we have a, you know, a country outside uh, this region to interfere in, uh, too much and too detail into the situation. So it's, I think it's not going to be very helpful. Much more of this debate still to come after the break. Stay tuned. Watching Kali Mahora with me, George Galloway, on Al Maidin Television, talking about China, Hong Kong, the United States, and the United Kingdom, and the state of at least economic war, which now appears to exist, with the danger also of a shooting war. Uh, Duncan, you heard uh, our expert from Beijing, um, and listening to David, he's kind of persuaded me. There won't be an accidental nuclear war uh, breaking out in the South China Sea. At least I hope he's right. Uh, it's therefore about economics, isn't it? Now, China is the second biggest economy in the world. By 2025, it will be the biggest economy in the world. There was a poll recently uh, of people in the ASEAN region uh, who were asked, uh, who is the most influential player in your region? And 91% of them said uh, China. Isn't this all about trying to slow down China's rise, to weaken it? 
Well, you're absolutely right. One of the remarkable stories of the last 40 years has been the economic rise of China. For most years, there's been an economic growth rate of around 10%. It's slowed down a bit in recent years, but it's still growing rapidly. This year, though, the Chinese government has not set a growth target because of the impact of the coronavirus. And I think until very recently, many countries around the world, including the United Kingdom and Germany and even the United States, said, great, this means that more people are being lifted out of poverty, it means there'll be more business to do with China, there'll be more opportunities for investment and trade on both sides. Hallelujah, they said, more Kentucky Fried Chicken for the Chinese customers and more Chinese goods for sale in Walmart or in Marks and Spencers. But then things began to change. In about 2012, when President Xi Jinping became the leader of China, there was a change of tone within China. It became more orthodox in terms of the way it interpreted communism. Nowadays, if you ring up a Chinese company on a Friday afternoon and ask to speak to one of the executives, the chances are that you'll hear the answer, they're in a meeting. Yes, they are in a meeting. They're in a, in a meeting with local communist officials in which they'll be studying the uh, teachings of Xi Jinping and trying to work out how to apply that to their business model. And that's one of the reasons why, as China's economy grows and its companies become more influential, there's a real concern all around the world, including in Asia, that those companies are agents of the Chinese state. Well, you say that, um, many would say that Apple and Amazon and Facebook and so on are effectively agents of uh, Western states, after all, uh, they, they have an open door policy, even if it's a back door, uh, between them. Uh, what's so offensive about uh, Chinese executives studying the direction of the state? Isn't that a good thing? So the Chinese position on many of those tech companies from America is that they won't allow them to be used in China. You can't really use Facebook, you can't really use Google and Gmail, you can't really use Twitter in China. And you can't use Huawei in America or Britain. Well, that's going to change, isn't it? I mean, you, there, there are going to be more restrictions on the, mm. on the way in which mm. Chinese companies interact. That's my point. It's a trade war, isn't it? It and, has been and, a trade and, war. And that, I'm wondering whether that's because people are studying... Uh, President Xi Jinping or because China's becoming really strong? I'm wondering which of those two is likely to be the reason for the trade war. Well, of course, the other reason behind the trade war is America's America first policy under President Trump. So that means that there's a greater nationalism within the United States and there's been a rise of nationalism in China. Ideologically, China is very different from the United States and from the European countries. I think there was a hope that perhaps as it became more integrated into the global trade system, that it would be able to accommodate these different perspectives. Now I think the view is that the Chinese are not going to be involved in the multilateral arrangements. They're not going to stick to the rules. And so America, having been frustrated with the actions of the WTO in trying to get China to play by the rules, took this unilateral action, which, as you rightly said, George, led to a massive trade war. And I'm afraid the results of that are, are still being played out. And they're going to have a big economic impact because China, now the second biggest economy in the world, if there is a recession in China, many countries around the world, of which China is the primary trading partner, will feel the impact. Father Frank, we've got a situation in the US in the run-up to a presidential election where the left, in inverted commas, is manic about Russia and the right, in inverted commas, is manic about China. Aren't they both playing look over there? Yes, I mean, there is a sort of um, uh, a game going on, which is, um, I mean... Um, Worrying, but at the same time, what do you expect party politics to be? Let's go back to China uh, to speak with John Ross, uh, who is a senior fellow of the Chongyang Institute at the Renmin University of China. Uh, Dr. Ross, uh, welcome to yeah. Kalimahorra. In your opinion, what are the reasons why uh, this conflict has now erupted between China and the West? Well, because the United States is in the worst crisis since the Vietnam War. 
the economy is in the biggest recession uh, since the Great Depression. So the, if it was the facts about this were recognized to be created where they were, which is in Washington, in the United States, this would be a catastrophe uh, for the political establishment in the United States. So they have to say that the problem is created by somebody else. That's created by China. This is ridiculous. I remember very well the famous statement of Muhammad Ali about the Vietnam War when he said, I ain't got no quarrel with them Viet Cong. They never called me the N-word. Uh, they never put dogs on me. Uh, they never shot my leaders. I've got no, his basis, I've got no quarrel with them. The enemy is at home, to use a famous phrase. This is the situation that the, re the reason that Americans are dying in huge numbers isn't because of anything to do with China, it's because of the policies which are happening in the United States. Will the West suffer uh, from the impact of this deteriorating situation between China and the West? Yeah, there's no, there's no doubt about that. Um, it, they lose in a very direct way. The Oxford Economics, which is absolutely not a pro-Chinese organization, it's a very reputable Western uh, economics organization, estimates that the average American family loses $880 a year um, because it's not able to import um, Chinese good value goods because of Trump's tariffs. Here, because of the attack on Huawei, we are going to be paying more for our mobile phones, uh, for mobile phone service, and we're gonna, it's going to be introduced later than is necessary in order to do what? In order to um, encourage the Cold War fantasies of the United States. We're, we're paying a very, very direct price for it, and the American people are paying a very direct price for it. Is Hong Kong really the reason for the deteriorating relations between the West and China? Well, I, I think it's shown very clearly by the vote in the United Nations on the, um, on the question of Hong Kong. My memory is right. About 50 developing countries voted in favor of the law in Hong Kong. And um, I think it was 22, if my memory is right, all uh, advanced allies of the United States, all white, except with the exception of Japan, uh, voted against. This tells you what you need to know about the situation in Hong Kong. David, um, Muhammad Ali had a point, didn't he? Uh, uh, he didn't have a quarrel with them, Viet Cong. Uh, do you have a quarrel with China? I, I don't have a quarrel with China because uh, um, simply from the, the perspective of uh, seeing the six from the angle of the nine, um, this, is, this is more about each country's sovereignty and each country's interest. Liberal democracy is not a God-given system of, uh, of governance. I don't know, it produced Donald um, Trump. Uh, that should be um, imposed or wished upon each nation. Um, if the Chinese administration or, you know, believe that and successfully so, uh, implementing their system of governance, um, which may not necessarily be juicy to the Western states. That is a matter for the Chinese nationals, you know, to go to the polls and vote out the president for, for not doing that, for not actually implementing the liberal democracy from the West. I think what is important is to look at the way forward in terms of you know, what happens with the issues that we're currently facing, the economic warfare, which has now been uh, somehow, um, you know, uh, translated, or to use that word, into some COVID-19, which has then exposed more the economic weaknesses of, of the Western countries. I mean, look at the way China has dealt with, with the virus. I mean, the argument is going to be that the virus began in China, so they had a better way of dealing with it than anyone else. But, you know, the, the, it is not a, uh, uh, a secret that we have the capabilities, and when I say we, I'm talking about the Western states, we have the capabilities and the capacities, we have the intelligence that could have determined or could have predicted the uh, COVID-19 even before it, it, it did, you know, um, appear in China. That is what they are paid for, looking at um, you know, uh, not just, you know, when China is going to throw the next missile or the next nuclear uh, bomb, but when a disease such as COVID-19 could be introduced into the society that would impact on the West. And that is what we've seen. The reason why the American economy, uh, you know, um, as the gentleman said, is, is struggling today, and the reason why the UK economy and all the, many other economies, especially in Africa, 
are struggling today is because you know, there's been a disease or a virus that has been introduced um, that uh, you know, we, we, we you keep we, saying introduced. Uh, are you implying that it was deliberately introduced? I mean, my, my philosophy has always been that you know nothing comes into existence that has never existed before. Um, you know, if this is new, then it's been created by man. Um, it's not. It's not coming from a natural animal because these animals are not new animals. But viruses mutate um, all the time. Viruses do mutate all the time. Uh, but there is no evidence that this is a mutated virus. You know, we've, uh, we've, we've got for every good scientific argument about this virus, there is equally a good argument against it. So you think um, China deliberately introduced this virus? I don't, I, I'm not saying that China deliberately introduced it, but... It, if indeed it, could, it came from China, it, there's a lot of argument that it yes. actually arose there is in a different parts There's a difference the between source and cause. Um, you know, a disease can come from China, but it doesn't necessarily mean it was developed by China. Um, China is not just uh, it's not a closed society for Chinese only. So um, you know, even though it came from China, it doesn't necessarily mean that um, it, it could be introduced by anyone else. So I think what is important here, um, uh, George, is for uh, is for us to look at the the impact that this war that we're experiencing today, the economic war, um, the, the the psychological warfare on you know, um, China's relationship with the West and the West relationship with China, which has been impacted by the very smaller nations. I'm not talking about the big ones, because the UK, the US, they've got things you know, under control. I mean, I'm not talking about the virus too, because you know, they, they don't have it under control, but different areas, they've got it under control. What we are experiencing is two big elephants, or three or four big elephants, fighting, and the smaller nations are the ones actually being impacted by all these viruses. Um, uh, warfare that is going on. Let's hear from uh, Professor Michael Dutton, who is he's the author of several books on China and teaches at Goldsmith University in London. Uh, Professor, welcome to Kalimahora. Right. Professor, some have described the current situation between the West and China as a new Cold War. What's your interpretation of that? I think I think it's been building up for quite some time. I mean, as China's risen as a power, I think there has been more and more tensions uh, with the West. Um, I suspect the UK has been drawn into this largely as a result of the United States. The specificity of the UK entry, however, is related to UK history. And of course, it goes back to Hong Kong. How do you think the upcoming US election is impacting all of this trouble between the West and China and what the uh, impact is likely to be on UK-Chinese relations. In terms of the US, I think Donald Trump will do basically anything to um, sort of advantage him in the forthcoming election. And I think they've basically made a decision in the United, uh, among the Republicans that the uh, uh, trade war with China would uh, rate well and would put them in a good position. So I suspect the American position is largely predicated, at least on the on the Trump side, in terms of his re-election. I think that uh, Biden has responded to that in a different way. And it seems to me that in the United States, at least, this seems to be a war of inflation. Who is more anti-China than who? Which is crazy. But let's leave America aside. The British situation, I think, is far more complicated. And I think Britain's situation, seems to me, is uh, basically really bizarre in some respects, insofar as uh, the argument around Brexit was that we want our sovereignty back. Um, it seems to me that in a sense, particularly moves around Huawei and so forth, are in a sense giving sovereignty to the United States in certain, in certain key areas. Um, so I think Britain has been brought into this partly as a result of its own histor history as a colonial power. Um, which basically ran Hong Kong right through to 1997 um, until the handover. Um, so they feel they have um, an interest uh, there. Um, but the general picture, it seems to me, is basically America pushing in a Cold War with China. In your view, who are the winners and who are the losers if this conflict between the West and China continues? Oh, I think if this... Cold War builds around trade. I think there are no winners. There are only losers. And it's the degree of loss. Um, I can't see it being of any benefit to anyone, really. I think it will just make things infinitely worse for both sides. I think it's particularly troubling at, at this point in time. I, um, 
there has been a, a sort of slight change in China. Well, not a slight change, a significant change in China since the emergence of Xi Jinping as the um, uh, paramount leader there. And um, Xi Jinping has basically been much more authoritarian. He's been much more um, determined to assert China's place in the world. Um, much and, and indeed, part of their policy, the policy of Idai, Idai Lu, one, one belt, one road, that policy is really, in a sense, part of that um, idea of China actually having much more of a say ar around the, the global table, as it were. Um, I think that that's been a significant change, which is then, in a sense, really partly accelerated the, the, the dispute with the United States. But it's not the main reason for it. I, I think that the, tra the trade war with the United States is really part of an agenda that's designed, as I say, to get Trump reelected. I think it's really an American initiated um, push. Um, that's not to say that, you know, what China's doing either, whether it's in Xinjiang or Hong Kong or whatever is entirely, you know, entirely right either. It's not to take sides in this. It's just to understand that, the, you know, they, I think the trade war is really something that the Americans have, have initiated. David, uh, isn't the professor right that, uh... China's more assertive role in the world uh, is what's really got them going, uh, and nowhere more so than, than in Africa, to which you referred earlier. China used to be referred to as the sleeping giant, um, but they, they are now the roaring giant. And, and that has caused, and continuously um, causes the other giants uh, to be concerned about the new money in the block. Um, and I often say when two people are fighting over a pound, one person wants to take more than 50p. And this is the, the situation in a larger scale um, where the bigger Western powers uh, you know, are threatened by the emergence of, of the sleeping giant. And where that happens in a much more bigger scale than what we see with the Huawei and the um, you know, the trade war between the US and, and China and the UK and the rest is China's presence in Africa. Um, China has and continuously, um, uh, you know, imposes its, its technical, um, you know, way of, I mean, I, mean, I was speaking to uh, a colleague of mine the other day and he said, um, you know, the Chinese are everywhere in Africa. Um, you know, you don't even know uh, how they get there, you know, how, how they manage to um, get their visas, who gives them the visas, who, you know, um, nobody has any database of the number of Chinese um, people that travel to Africa these days. So, you know, you, you, you can see how that impact, the, the impact yes, of because the... because once of, upon a time, it was yeah. the white man that was everywhere in Africa. The yes. colonialists. Yes. Uh, um, and, and now it's Chinese. Yes, I mean, th and that is the, the concerning thing, because, you know, we're not talking of new colonialism, but we're talking about a new uh, kind of a, a, a Chinese colonization style. But that is up to the African countries who have gone through the Western colonization to be able to recognize um, how this relationship with China should actually be dealt with. Of course, African countries are no longer, you know, the same like they were in before the 60s. But of course, you still have, um, you know, uh, the, the, the presence of the West, uh, the influence of the West within African states. And that is why I did mention that what we're experiencing today is a proxy war between China and the West rather than a Cold War. The days of Cold War are gone. We should be talking about a proxy war. We should be talking about an economic warfare. Because that is what is actually going on between China and the rest of the world. And that plays a huge, um, you know, we've seen that in a huge theatre in Africa, where most of the African governments now have got China to rely on, and they've got the West to rely on. So there is some kind of a competition, an existing one, between who is going to be the better partner to deal with. And, you know, perhaps if the African countries are wise enough, it gives them the better option to be able to make a decision as to whether they want to deal with any of them or neither of them. Duncan, is David right that this is really all about a lot of elephants in the room, one of whom is newly arrived, butting heads? 
Well, the narrative, as we've talked about, has been about great power competition. And that leaves countries all over the world, including Africa and Europe and in Asia, with a dilemma. Who do they side with? In terms of business and economics, there are many good reasons to trade with China. Take Germany, for instance. It's making an enormous amount of business with China. Volkswagen has had a big office in Beijing since 1985. Now the Americans are saying, are you our, 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 are you our ally, Germany? Do you want us to keep the US forces stationed in Germany? What's your relationship with China then on a business front, on a diplomatic front? They're, they're breathing down the neck of the Germans, forcing them into a decision. It's not an easy situation for Angela Merkel. She's a very experienced diplomat and now she's got a dilemma because the anti-China or the Sino-skeptic mood in Germany is rising. Exactly the same thing happened here. I think this has been partly due to a mistake that China made and that was in trying to restrict the freedom of the press, particularly the foreign press, when they went to China. A few years ago, I can remember being at an editorial meeting inside one of the big broadcasters, and the people who were reporting China said, we, we're just not being able to get the interviews, people aren't talking to us, and sometimes we're getting hassled when we take our cameras out and our microphones out to talk to ordinary Chinese people. Now, the problem is that if you restrict the freedom of the press, then you get a reaction back. The reaction from the journalists and the editors is to say, we want to show our independence and therefore we'll be critical of the government. And that criticism's increased, not just in the British media, but globally, particularly among the free press, who've been saying, let's stand up for human rights and democracy in Xinjiang and Tibet and Taiwan, and all these other issues have got mixed up with it. And the result is that China's had a bad press. That's then led to a change in the political mood. As I mentioned earlier on, here in Britain, not just the right, but the left and the centre ground have all become much more sceptical about China. And that's true all around the world. So there's a dilemma, and that's being played out in a very public arena now. But the, the point that you make, the, the journalists have changed, you're right. Uh, there's now uh, more or less open season uh, on China. Uh, the political plurality you describe, I would think, is a very narrow bandwidth. Uh, the distance between Sir Keir Starmer and, and Boris Johnson is not actually great, particularly on, uh, on foreign affairs. But you're right to say uh, there is, uh, in mainstream politics, uh, uh, a convergence, a consensus uh, about China. So w where is it all going to end? Well, I think what we'll see is that there's going to be much more difficulty of doing business with China if you also want to do business with the United States. If you're a country which says, OK, well, I'm a small African state, the main thing is that I get that Chinese investment in the infrastructure, and in return for that, of course, the Africans send their natural resources to China, and that's been one of the things that's been fueling Chinese economic growth. So it's not as though the Africans are just getting a, a, a great present from China, they're buying it in return, I should just add. You might say to yourself, well, I'm not too worried about what happens in terms of the trade and diplomatic relationship with America. I'll go with the Chinese. That's clearly where the economic benefit is. But if you're a liberal democracy, and that's across a whole range of different sorts of political systems across Europe and Asia and so on, and you want to stay friendly with the United States, the world's biggest economy, the biggest military, four times bigger than the Chinese military, then you're going to find it much more difficult to have that open, friendly relationship with China at the same time. The Americans are saying, you're going to have to make a choice. Well, there you go, Father. Last word to you. Uh, you're going to have to make a choice. What's your choice? Well, America or China? I would like to have both. Um, but I started by saying that uh, China is a great civilization with all the features of civilization. And I do have, I do like, I have confidence that the Chinese people, one of my best friends who are actually very active in certain courses, is Chinese. But the question is, we saw some years ago at Tiananmen Square how the Chinese people are able actually to fight back against a centralized, centralistic, totalitarian regime. So my hopes are for a change, a regime change in Beijing, which would encourage internal freedom and freedom of religion, freedom of opinion, 
and, uh, and the flourishing of the Chinese people in ways which are in tune with the great past. Now, China, even if uh, uh, China would change the regime, it would still be an important economic influence of the world, but it would not be so in ways which are aimed at the uh, destruction of human freedom. You know, there is a quotation I love. There is one Chinese leader, communist leader, who said, a white cat is a black cat if a party says so. So if you have a regime which has a conception of truth, which is so uh, relativistic to their own interests, you can't really trust the regime. And yet the regime has lifted more people out of poverty than any regime ever in human history. But it might actually sink them back into poverty if America goes don't, to uh, I know you're not a betting man, but don't bet your house uh, on that. We could keep this going, believe me, for another hour. But alas, that's the end of the show. I've been George Galloway. This has been Kali Mahorra. Thank you very much for watching.